For our scripture reading today, I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 21, and uh, there is a pew Bible. I forgot to check the page number on that, if you'd like to look along, or, uh, oh, the words are right behind me as well. <laughs> I hope they match with what I'm reading. I've never mentioned this, but I'm a little dyslexic, so if I flip things around, just go with the flow, Okay. Yeah, in uh, Matthew chapter 21, um, this is the account uh, that Matthew gives of the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. When they had come near Jerusalem and re reached Beth Bethage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus of Nazareth of Galilee. My topic today is going to come from uh, this passage and other passages on uh, the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I call this On the Road to Calvary, because uh, the end of this week, Jesus is going to be crucified on the cross. Now, the word Calvary only occurs one time in the Bible, uh, and that is in the King James Version of the Bible. The word Calvary itself comes from the word cranion in the Greek, which means cranium in English. It means skull. There was a hill outside Jerusalem that was called in Aramaic Golgotha, but translated into English as the hill of the skull. It was a place that the Romans had set aside for public executions of criminals. And uh, Jesus on this Palm Sunday, is entering into Jerusalem. And Jesus has been saying all along in the Gospel of John, my hour is not yet come, my hour is not yet come, my hour is not yet come. And we come to this point where he's going to go into Jerusalem and he says, my hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. You see, Jesus knew that he was on a mission. Very early in the Gospel of John, third chapter, he met with a man by the name of Nicodemus. And he told Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He was telling them what kind of death he would die. Now, the passage here that we read said that this was to fulfill Scripture. The Scripture it was fulfilling that day is found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Uh, where, where it says, Behold, your king comes to you. He's lowly, riding on a donkey, on the, the, the colt of a donkey, the foal of a donkey. And, and, and that passage was being fulfilled that Jesus was officially presenting himself as the king of the Jews. Now, just fast forward really quickly, a few days down the road, five, five days, and they are crying out. We have no king but Caesar. He is not our king. And so a lot transpired in these five days. I call this on the road to Calvary, on the road to Golgotha, on the road to the cross. And, and I, when you are on the road to the cross, you find that the, along the way that you are going to actually pick up some people. You pick up curiosity seekers. In fact, if we were to look at the scriptures here in this passage, you find a very large crowd 
You find that expression again. A very large crowd. This is the crowds. They were spreading their coats before him. They're, they're following behind him. We have this massive crowd. Now, I, I, I just have to believe that in this crowd, if we were like an investigative reporter that day, and we were out among the crowd uh, and, and, say, and finding out who was there, I think you would find that the people who were there, first of all, among that crowd, there were curiosity seekers. These curiosity seekers are of, of all kinds of, of people. The first group of the curiosity seekers were those who were from Bethany itself. The people from Bethany had witnessed, I believe, just about a week prior. It may have been a little bit more. The text doesn't tell us for sure. But it wasn't much more than that, two weeks at the most. They had witnessed a scene like never before in their whole lives. Jesus had come to Bethany because his friend Lazarus had died. And Lazarus was dead, and Jesus got to the site where the tomb was, and he said, roll away the stone. And they said, well, wait a minute, Jesus. Lazarus has been dead for four days. I like the way King James puts it. He stinketh. Yeah, the body was starting to decompose. Jesus, what do you mean? He said, roll away the stone. And then Jesus prays a little short prayer, said, Lord, I, I know that you're going to do this, and I'm praying not for my sake, but for theirs that they'll believe. And then he says, Lazarus, good thing he said that, come forth. Somebody said, good thing he said Lazarus, because if he'd only said come forth, everybody would have popped out of their graves. <laughs> Lazarus, come forth. He comes, he's bound, you see, he's been wrapped in grave clothes. I just see him kind of hopping out. And he comes out, he says, unwrap him. This miracle, the text goes on to say that the people that were there, they believed. And believe me, I believe too. You know, I've done several funerals in my day. And everybody we wound up putting in the ground. You know what? They're still in the ground. If I were doing the funeral and he all of a sudden got up, I'd say, whoa. <laughs> I would believe something miraculous was happening. <clears throat> Jesus performs his miracle. It is so powerful a miracle, word has spread. So there is a crowd when Jesus gets up and he leaves from Bethany to Jerusalem. And it's only a couple miles a uh, distance there, southeast of, of Jerusalem. And he's coming to the Mount of Olives. And when he crests the Mount of Olives, he sees the city of Jerusalem and he weeps over Jerusalem. They're like, like lost sheep without a shepherd. He makes his descent. Uh, he goes, they, they get the, the donkey, and he's riding on the donkey. And, and there's in that crowd those who are real believers, curiosity seekers, because they know and they've heard others in Bethany that weren't even there when it happened. They heard what has happened. They've gathered together, and they're in the crowd. They're seeking Jesus. Now, also in that crowd, there are probably um, some skeptics. They weren't there and said, come on, nobody raised us from the dead. I, I, I just can't believe it. There's got to be another explanation. You know how it is? You know, uh, I, I'm, Jesus changed my life. I tell people about the G life G Jesus did, and they, you just had a psychological experience. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Jesus changed my life. There's the skeptic. They were in the crowd. I'm sure they, they were in the crowd. This, the, it couldn't have happened. We've got to figure it out. Uh, there's also the, the, you know, the agnostic. The agnostic is the person who says, well, I don't know. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. I don't know that you could really know, but I, I'm here. I was doing door-to-door -door visitation one time, knocking on doors, trying to share my faith, and the guy in the inside yelled to me. He said, go away, I'm an agnostic. As I would said, I'm pastor from Whitehall Baptist Church in Philadelphia. And, and, and he said, go away, I'm an agnostic. I knocked a little bit more. He came to the door finally. He said, listen, I'm an agnostic. I said, that's exactly where I'm at your door. I said, agnostic, ah, uh, means no, gnostic, from gnosis, no, I don't know. You don't know, I do know, let me tell you. <laughs> so I still don't want any clue when I went the door. And, but it all ties into what's going on here on this triumphal entry of Jesus. There are those who are in the crowd. Uh, there, there are some like uh, the seekers in the crowd, they're like the zealots of Jesus' day. We get the whole idea of zealous. These zealots, they were politically motivated and charged. 
They wanted to throw off the Roman Empire, and they wanted Jesus to be their king to throw off the Roman Empire, not for a spiritual reason. <clears throat> they had wrong motives for seeking Jesus. You see, there's people like that in every crowd. Every church crowd has a person who's there for the wrong motive. They've come maybe because, well, maybe I can get a little business influence here with so-and-so, or I get a little tension here, or, or a, a single person saying, well, maybe I can find a, a good, good date. Uh, the ulterior motives, wrong motives. But th there is in that crowd, these seekers, they're looking for Jesus, and they're seeking out Jesus. Uh, some because they truly believe, and some because they're skeptical. Some they just don't know, don't know if you can know. And then there are, there, are, there are some that are just zealous and they got the wrong motives, but they want somebody to lead them where Jesus is not really going to take them. And, and then in the crowd, you know, of these seekers, you also have those who, uh, who are party animals. You know what I mean? Here's a big crowd. I like parties. I, listen, they're cheering, they're shouting. I, I don't know what it's all about, but I'm going to go be part of it. They're just in it for the party. And, and they're along well. Everything's going well, man. It's like church day. Everything's going well. Everybody jumps on. They jump on. They like the crowd, the enthusiasm. You ask them what they're there for. I don't know. We're just having a good time. And then, of course, Jesus and this crowd, they make their way, as, as we go to the next slide, as they make their way in, into Jerusalem, it says, when he entered, the whole crowd is with him. The whole city was in turmoil because of the racket and the party that's going on because Jesus is coming. The kids are singing. And it says he gets into the city. It's a Passover time. city of Jerusalem is just packed with people. And they say, who is this? You see, they're seeking. Who is he? Who is this guy? It's disrupting everything so much. There's always the genuine seeker. I think, in every crowd. You cut away all the rest of that stuff, and there's a person really there saying, I really do want to know who Jesus is. They're in that crowd. There's probably someone here like that today. I really want to know who Jesus is. There are seekers that were on the road. You pick up these seekers along the way, the Calvary Road, and uh, the, next, the next one that we go to here as you uh, move along, you pick up the needy. You see, he goes into Jerusalem, and uh, the next text here of, of this passage says that the blind and the lame, they actually came to him in the temple. Jesus makes his way up into, uh, uh, into Jerusalem through the eastern gate, right into the temple. And, and it says the blind and the lame came to him. These are needy people. <clears throat> I wonder if, because just before... Jesus made his way to Bethany. He was at Jericho. And at Jericho in the gate, there was a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus. And he was shouting, Son of David! Son of David! And he's crying, and he said, be, be quiet, be quiet. Don't say anything. Don't disturb Jesus. He started shouting all the louder. And Jesus stops, and he pauses. And uh, they say, get up, get up. He's, he's calling for you. He gets up, and he goes over, and he says, <clears throat> what do you want? Jesus says to him. He says, I want my sight. Jesus said, go, and he went away seeing. Text went on to say he began to follow Jesus. I think there's this guy in the crowd who once was blind but now can see. He's in the crowd with Jesus. He's come down through <clears throat> down the, the Kedron Valley and up into Jerusalem. He's in the temple. <clears throat> there's a blind there. And the crowd is saying, there's a blind here. Hey, this guy was blind. He can see now. Jesus healed him. And all of a sudden, he's got this group of blind people saying, Jesus, heal me, heal me. There's also the lame there. Jesus' ministry has been about healing people all along. You know, there, there was the man at the pool of Siloam or uh, Bethesda, the Bethesda pool just north of Jerusalem, uh, the, the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, they had all this colonnades around, and, and all the, the lame would gather there, and they would ask people to put them down into the water. And, and Jesus came along, and he looked at the man, and he said, do you want to be made well? What's the answer to that? Yes. You know what his answer was? I don't have anybody to put me in the water. <laughs> Wrong answer. 
So Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath day. That causes quite a controversy because you're not supposed to carry your mat because he told him to take up his mat and go. You're not supposed to carry your mat on the Sabbath day. You're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath day. And so it causes quite a controversy. Jesus is a controversial figure. But in the temple, there's the needy hoping and praying for the miracle of God. And Jesus is there. It's kind of like church today. Not just physical needs. There's more than physical needs. There's emotional needs. Often Jesus would be encountered by people who had demons. He'd cast the demon out and they'd have peace at last. Emotional tranquility. There's people with intellectual needs. You know, the Apostle Paul was an intellectual giant. And, uh, but he didn't know what he was really seeking until he found Jesus. There's people with uh, financial needs. Jesus, when he was uh, in the temple at one previous occasion, his attention was caught by a, a little old widow who was giving her offering and her offering was her last two mites. <clears throat> now in the temple, where they gave the offerings, they were these, they were called trumpets. They looked like a trumpet. They came up, and you drop your coin in. Do you ever see the ones that, you know, where you put the coin in, and it goes zzz, 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 all around, 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 real fast and drops in? Two coins, and I can just imagine, that's exactly what they did. Hit that one, zzz, 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 clunk. Whereas everybody else is just pouring in all their... It's just going in. Jesus notices, and he says to the disciples, this woman said, those all the others gave out of the... But she gave out of her dire poverty, her last two might. She gave her all. You know what? Great is her reward in heaven. She, she has great financial need. I, I believe there's the needy that were there. Of course, there's a spiritual needy. You get a man like Nicodemus. He's a scholar. He knows the word of God. He sneaks to Jesus by night and says, we know you're a great teacher from God. For nobody can do the miracles you do, Jesus. And Jesus said, you must be born again. Somehow, Nicodemus, you missed it. You've got to be born again. You see, Nicodemus was searching for something that even as a religious person he couldn't find because you can't, if you don't have Jesus, if you don't have him as your Savior, you can be as religious as you want and still be in great need. Jesus is the one who fulfills all our needs. All these things, all these needs that he's, we've been talking about, Jesus, who picks up the needy along the way, he cured them. He cured them. He's the only one that can cure them. Some people have come to Jesus with a relationship need. That's what the woman at the well was all about. She had a relationship need. When she's talking to Jesus, Jesus finally says to her, uh, go get your husband. She says, well, I have no husband. He said, oh, you've answered correctly. <laughs> you've had five husbands, and the, the man you're now living with is not your husband. You've had such bad relationships that you've given up on it altogether. You're just living with a guy. You're not even getting married. She said, man, I know that you're a prophet come from God. She goes back, tells the whole city that this man told me everything I ever did. The city comes out and they all believe in Jesus. You see, Jesus cures. He meets the needs of the people. On Palm Sunday, Jesus was on the road to Calvary. He was on the road and there were seekers in the crowd. There's the needy that's in the crowd. And as we go on to the next slide, we'll see that there's actually adversaries in the crowd. The text says this. When the, the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did, and they heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to David, they became very angry. I'm going to tell you something. That's putting it very mildly that they were angry. John tells us they wanted to kill Jesus. John tells us this miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead was so powerful they wanted to kill Lazarus too. You see, they wanted to kill the miracle worker, and they also wanted to kill the miracle. And so along the way, when you're following Jesus, you're going to find that there's people who just don't like you. Later in uh, John chapter 17, uh, later after Jesus entered the city, and, and he's in the upper room discourse, and, and uh, after that, then he goes into the garden, he prays. 
He says, if they've hated me, they will hate you. They will hate you. You see, on the road to Calvary, you pick up some adversaries. Now, the next thing that we see in this passage is that you pick up some followers. In fact, it says this in the text. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, they they remembered these things that had been written uh, of him and had been done to him. you got to love the disciples. The word disciple means follower. And when I try to illustrate this with children, I do a little uh, follow the leader. Because Jesus is the leader and I'm the follower. Peter says we're to follow in his steps. And so, a disciple is a follower. Now, I've noticed that when I play follow leader with the kids, they don't really follow in my steps completely. They kind of meander a little bit off the trail and any little thing gets their attention. That's just like us. It's just like the disciples. the, The term disciple for Jesus is a fully devoted follower of him. And I want to be a fully devoted follower of him, but man, I just get out of the step often. And the 12 disciples also did the same. But in the bottom line, with the exception of one, Judas, they all follow the leader to their death. To their death. With the exception of John the Apostle, who was exiled to Patmos for the end of his life, all the other disciples, the 12 apostles, they are martyred for their faith. They are fully devoted followers of Jesus. So along the way, you pick up these these disciples in the crowd. Now, I notice here that they didn't quite get it. When I'm reading Gospel of John, I'm kind of saying, duh, what's wrong with you disciples? They just don't seem to get what he's talking about. But when the Holy Spirit finally comes, it's like the lights are turned on. The text says when Jesus is glorified after he dies... He's buried, he's risen again, and he's in his resurrected glory. It's then when he was glorified that it all came together for them. And then they say, oh yeah, it does say in Zechariah 9.9 that the Lord is going to come as a king, presenting himself, riding on a donkey. Oh yeah, it does say in Daniel chapter 9 that he's going to have to be crucified. Oh yeah, it does say in Isaiah 53, he's going to be uh, dying for my sins. All we like sheep have gone astray. And and they they start to put all the dots together. And that's what we do as followers. We start out as a newborn babe in Christ, and then we grow, and we grow, and we grow. There's another thing I noticed, according to the the slides here, is that uh, you also pick up a cross along the way. Fast forward to me, with me. We've gone from the Sunday to Friday. We've had the upper room discourse. We've had Jesus go down into the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been praying. Judas comes and betrays him with a kiss. The soldiers take him. He goes to illegal trials through the night. And he's now standing finally before Pilate. And Pilate is saying, behold your king. And the people say, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him, crucify him. And the text goes on and it says, and Pilate handed them over, handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself. And you know the story. We have to go to the next slide to see the, the, that part there. Jesus is carrying the cross by himself as they led him away. And, and, and apparently he falls, or, or he, under the beatings he's had, he, he can't carry the, the cross any further. And they siege a man called Simon, and they grab Simon, and, and uh, they laid the cross on him. Simon carried Jesus' cross. The moment they took it from Jesus and gave it to Simon, now it is Simon's cross, right? It's Simon's cross to bear. Simon carries the cross to Calvary, the skull, the place of execution, but Simon doesn't die on the cross. Who dies on the cross? Jesus dies on Simon's cross, which Simon's cross was Jesus' cross. You get this? Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
You see, Simon's cross was Jesus' cross, or Jesus' cross was Simon's cross. Uh, Jesus' cross is my cross. I have been crucified with Christ. And yet my cross is Jesus' cross. He died. God said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God made him to be sin, the one who knew no sin, that I might become the righteousness of God in him. So, so when I take up a cross, I'm actually taking up Jesus' cross because Jesus died for my sins, so now I'm dead to my sins. They've all been paid for. I think this is kind of helps explain what it says in the next slide here. Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my follower, you want to be my disciples? He says, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So every day, I take up the cross. It's my cross, but it's really Jesus' cross because he's the one who died on the cross. I take up the cross of Jesus and I make it mine. And I say, you know what? I'm living today on a death march like Simon did, carrying the cross of Jesus because Jesus died on the cross for me. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So the life that I now live, I live in faith of the Son of God who died for me. I, I live for, for him. And so daily I take this up and I follow him. I follow him. For those who want to save their lives will lose it. But those who lose their lives for my sake, they will save it. There comes a point where I've got to surrender. Not my life. I surrender my life for Christ. My will for his will. I yield to him. In fact, Jesus goes on to say this earlier. He had said this in this passage. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. At some point, I've got to make that act of faith where I believe in Jesus, that he died for my sins. I'm taking on the cross of Christ and saying, yes, you are my Savior who died for me, and I'm putting death to myself so there's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I'm not a poker player, but I've watched enough movies to know that when you're dealt a good hand, you take all your chips and you say, I'm all in. <laughs> I'm all in. Here's the hand we were dealt. First card, the cross of Christ. Good card. That's like Trump. I don't care what the game is. That's Trump. Second card I'm dealt, whoa, empty tomb. Whoa, that's even better than the first card. But my second Trump card. Third card, whoa, resurrected, ascending Savior. He's going up into heaven. <laughs> Next card I'm dealt, whoa, he's coming back for me. I got a winner's hand, so what do I do? I take all my chips, I take my whole life, I take all that I am, all that I have, and I push it and I say, Lord Jesus, I'm all in. Right? I'm all in. I'm all in. So what are you saying here? You take up your cross, you're saying, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm all yours. There's an old hymn, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not singing it, but I'll quote some of it. It's called, Follow Me. I traveled down a lonely road. No one seemed to care. The burden on my weary back had bowed me to despair. I oft complained to Jesus how folk were treating me. And then I heard him say so tenderly. My feet were also weary upon the Calvary road. The cross became so heavy, I fell beneath the load. Be faithful, weary pilgrim, the morning I can see. Just take your cross and follow close to me. O oh Lord, if I should die upon a foreign field someday, t'would be no more that love could demand, no more could love repay. For greater love hath no mortal man than for his friends to die. These are the words he spoke to me. If just a cup of water I place within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that I demand. So if by death to living I do thy glory see, O Lord, I'll take my cross and follow close to thee. You know what he's saying? I'm all in. I'm all in. Palm Sunday is about the road to Calvary 
and the people saying, I'm all in. I'm all in. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is a time for us to reflect. Am I all in? Perhaps right now, Lord, in the quietness of this moment, there's some things we need to say to you, Lord. Like, forgive me for wandering off the path and not following closely to Jesus. Or, Lord, I'm here for the first time. I've never been a follower, and today I want to begin the journey. Save me, O Lord. Hosanna. Pray. I pray. Save me. Lord, you will hear our hearts. You'll hear our cry. And you will save. You are the Savior. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us the impetus within our hearts to go from this place all in for Jesus. Wherever that path leads, and we know for Jesus it led to the cross. But we're willing to lose our lives for you and save it rather than save our lives and lose it. We don't want to gain the whole world and lose our soul. We'd rather lose the whole world and gain our soul. So, Lord, accept us now as all in for Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.